Ooh. Gentlemen. Larry. Welcome back. Yes. Episode two of The Last Trade. <laughs> it's We've, good to be back. It's good to be here. Welcome, Larry. Thank you. Nice to be with you guys. It's always an honor. You guys are the core of Bitcoin. Oh, I'll stop that. That is, that is too much. That's too much. We're all in this together. That's for sure. <laughs> and we're, uh, we've got a lot going on right now. We've had a bit of breaking news. Larry, I think this is the first time you're going to see this video. It happened about an hour ago. I think we start here as a jumping off point because uh, it's extremely emblematic of the state of our country. Uh, weak leadership uh, and chaos. And so we're, we're going to go to the Air Force Academy graduation if Logan can figure it out here. There we go. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, it's sad. You never like to see the president of the United States falling like this and in an extremely weak position. He's old. He's feeble. He seems to be losing his mind a bit. But again, it's, it's emblematic of the state of our country. The fact that he was able to get the office and now they plan on running him again yeah. in the face of everything going on with the debt ceiling, the banking crisis. And not only are they going to run again, they're going to run, they're going to try to, at least the DNC is, without any competition, with no primaries, no debates, nothing like that. It, Larry, you're, you're the elder statesman on the show today. <laughs> Have you ever seen anything this crazy at the presidential level? No, I mean, it's, no, I mean it, it's sad. I feel sorry for the guy. I feel sorry for the country. I mean, it's, you know, we are an empire in late stage decline. And, um, you know, it's, this is one of many symbols of it. Just a small, just a small brick in the wall of watching this thing come unglued. Right. And it's, it's really sad. Um, but I'm very happy and very encouraged because there are a lot of young guys like you carrying spears ready to charge the Citadel and put a stake in the heart of Fiat, <laughs> which is absolutely <laughs> what has to happen. I, I've, been, I've been fighting this battle for 30 years and I was alone. And it's like I got the reinforcements showed up, right? You guys are the reinforcements. So as a, as a senior guy in the, in the space, I can say I couldn't be happier and more honored to have young champions like all of you three and, you know, so many others, you know, Odell, Mahlers, it's a, the list just goes on and on, uh, fighting this battle. It's great. It's just great. Well, like Larry, not to put you on the spot, but that is a very soft money physique. Uh, you know, you, you, we, we connected, I always go back to the 2021 Miami dinner and, you know, the conversations and your story. And one of the things I remember you telling me is how you got into, um, CrossFit and that you needed, you know, as we win, you need to be around and in good shape to, to outlast all these guys. And I've been seeing you on Twitter. You're in incredible shape. Two years in, you're you're out there leading the charge in Miami. What's going on there? Well, I, you know, look, it's I read a book called Younger Le Younger Next Year years ago in my 50s. And you guys, I don't think any of you are even approaching 50. In fact, I'm not sure you guys are 40 yet. Um, one thing's, I can tell you one thing is going to happen. When you get to be 50, you're going to start to notice that uh, your physical condition just isn't what it used to be. I mean, you can kind of fake it in your 20s and 30s, come back fast, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd already solved the drinking problem. I haven't drank for 30 years, so that was a, I don't have that issue. But uh, I was starting to get weak. And, um, you know, I was in a battle for sound money life from 2011 to 2015. I watched about half of my net worth go away. And I, it had already taken a pretty substantial hit when they changed the rules on um, short selling uh, uh, financial stocks, which I was loaded to the gills on in 2008. And, and that was what radicalized me for sound money. Um, the, you know, the assholes on the other side changed the rules as necessary to keep their system alive. And uh, I realized that, you know, uh, at the time, I thought, shit, maybe we're going to lose. Um, uh, well, no, I know we're on the right side of righteousness and justice. And I know that ultimately, those things prevail, because I'm spiritual, and I really believe in a higher power taking us to the right place. And so I thought, all right, if that's going to happen, I got to be here to see it. Because I don't want to miss the conclusion, and um, so I started studying how do you live long, and part of living long, I think, is uh, being in good physical shape. So I researched that, and came to the conclusion that the Navy SEALs, who are a big part of the CrossFit tradition, uh, are kind of the guys who are in the ultimate of physical shape. And so I thought, all right, this is going to hurt, but that's what I got to do. And so I went to a CrossFit gym. I was out, very out of shape, probably weighed thirty pounds more than I do now, 
And I said, can you get an old guy like me into shape? And they said, absolutely. The only thing you got to do is you got to keep walking through the fucking door, you know, just and do what you can. And so I just started walking through the fucking door every day. And uh, I'm really not in very good shape. There are a lot of guys my age who are in much, much better shape than me. I see them all the time at the gym and I'm humbled by them. But I show up and consistently all the time. And, uh, and that's really what it's all about, right? There are things we can't control in this world. But what we can control is our own personal attitude and our own personal desire to show up and fight for what we believe is right. And so, you know, to me, physically strong is mentally strong and mentally strong will lead you to the right conclusions about what's broken. Um, you know, particularly as, as Marty so adequately coined the phrase, so brilliantly coined the phrase, fix the money, fix the world. Um, you know, we've got to fix the money. And, I, you know, the physical piece is just... So I'm here to see the conclusion because <laughs> I don't want to miss it. I want to see I want to see these fiat assholes defeated, and we will. But it, you know, could take a little time, right? So oh. that's how I got, that's how I got here. And I, as again, I say, I really when you guys say you're in great shape, I'm like, no, I'm not. But I'm in better shape than a lot of guys my age, and uh, and I think that increases the likelihood that I'll be here to see the end game, which is really that's really my goal to see the end game. Well, in terms of like timeline. How long is it going to take to see that end game? I think that's a lot about what we're going to talk. Happy to talk about that. I have a lot of views. On, I have a lot of views on that, so we can cover that. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's in the news this week? We have the debt ceiling. What was an impasse this time last week seems to be coming to a conclusion, which is what has been the norm for the last decade. Which is all right. We're going to raise the debt ceiling. There's some nuance to the mechanics of this ceiling raise i guess we'll call it the ceiling doesn't really exist it's a mirage it's a uniparty system that's going to push the limit up no matter what because they have to due to the nature of the fiat crisis that we have been subjected to um, but this one is particularly interesting because uh, they, they raised the limit and there currently is no limit and they'll reapproach the subject at the beginning of 2025 which at that point will be a lame duck session because we'll have the election in 2024 uh, we'll have a lame duck between 2024, fall 2024, and February of 2025, after which point all the committees need to get put in place. And so in reality, the debt ceiling probably won't be approached again until what, late 2026? Jesse, I see you shaking probably, your head. They may kick it a couple of years. I mean, by my estimates, we're running about a $2 trillion annual deficit, perhaps more. I think it's going to be more. But if we're at $2 trillion now, and it's certainly not going down in the next few years, that easily gets us to 35 trillion of debt. Um, and I retweeted something um, this morning about how all that debt is stacked into the close, the nearby maturities. And so, you know, as a result, they've just got to roll over large, large amounts of debt and it's going to be a real problem for them. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to me that they didn't even put a cap on it. They just said it's open-ended until early 2025. I mean, the way things are going, it could be 35, six, seven, eight, you know, trillion dollars of debt by that time. And they'll probably try and kick it a few more years beyond that. I don't know if they'll make it that far. I mean, it's it's open it's open ended to me as to when this whole thing ends and when we get hyper Bitcoinization. Uh, but I feel like that is coming, and with every swing, we get closer to it, right? Yep, I, th I think we are currently on track for two point two trillion in in deficit this year. And if um, tax receipts sour more, I saw a projection for up to two point nine trillion in deficit wow. for twenty twenty three. Wow. Um, yeah. And yeah, so like you quickly get to four trillion more in, in national debt. <laughs> and and that that's not going to take us very long to get there. That's going to take us at that rate. That's uh, less than two years to add Correct. four trillion dollars, which is which is more than 10 percent to our national debt. Uh, and yeah, and then the interest expense this is this other like ticking time bomb that's sneaking in where it's currently at um, 700 or maybe $800 billion a year uh, in interest expense right now, if interest rates stay flat and these, these maturities roll over at the current interest, exp uh, interest rate, um, which is five plus percent, then you're talking about adding another $800 billion in interest expense um, right. on top of what we're currently spending, which is the whole budget for, for the military. 
and that's going to come out of where like that comes out of more deficit. So it's just a nightmare in slow motion right now. And that for the, this, this lifting the, the debt ceiling, which is this, you know, this battle between left and right and both sides are taking real serious swings at the other side and, and demanding concessions only to have what happen. We're just going to add as much debt as we want um, because and, and not even admit how much debt we're uh, rubber stamping because instead of saying this will add $4 trillion of debt over the next two years when we then kick the can further down the road again, instead of that, we're saying we're, we're lifting, we're suspending the debt ceiling rather than right. actually introducing that number, um, which people should be aware of and should be mad as hell about. Yeah, it's a doom loop. I mean, it, and it's this is not something new. It, it's happened before in many other countries. It hasn't happened in the reserve currency since the Roman Empire fell when, you know, their currency was ostensibly the reserve currency at the time. And uh, But this has happened in, you know, Venezuela, Argentina, Brazil, Weimar, Germany, Zimbabwe, you know, on and on. And, and so, you know, when you have to print money to cover your interest and in principal payments, um, it's not long until your currency ultimately fails. Um, and by not long, I mean maybe at the outside 10 years and maybe at the inside a couple of years. It's, it's interesting because we've got social media, so things, things go faster now, right? I mean, I was stunned. The Silicon Valley Bank, which was my bank because Boston Private had been bought by them, they had $42 billion of uh, withdrawals in one day. And then the following day, $100 billion showed up. So with the click of a mouse, billions of dollars move. And so when it becomes obvious to everybody that you know, the, the currency is failing, um, you know, it, it is truly Hemingway's slowly and then all at once. Um, and so that's, that's what we're looking at <laughs> yet. We don't know the slope of that curve and they have, they have more moves in their bag of tricks, no doubt. And we have to assume that, I mean, these people are smart and evil. And so they will find ways to extend their privilege as long as they possibly can. We know that I saw that. I learned that the hard way in 2008. So, you know, we have to be prepared for the counter moves, but inexorably, it's moving in our direction. And uh, I take great comfort in that. <laughs> but, but I have a question here for, you, for that, Larry. Um, so when does the bond market wise up? You know, the, <laughs> there's $300 trillion sitting in, in debt instruments that are going to deliver negative. We talked with Dylan McClare last week about how the math points to negative real returns for bonds over the coming decade. And they don't need to be sitting in bonds. They could be reallocating to an asset that has increasing scarcity and can deliver reliable returns because of that. It's a great question. It's really the big unknown, right? I mean, some of those, you know, some of the bond markets are artificial. They paint the tape in the bond market just like they paint it everywhere else. Um, they have backdoor ways of buying it and supporting it. Um, you know, I, I think, frankly, the bond market is wising up. I mean, if you look at Luke's, Luke Groman's charts, he's got great charts that show how holdings of U.S. government treasuries have been decreasing steadily throughout the world. And, you know, the, the old form of sound money, gold, uh, has been increasing. Um, you know, holdings of those by governments have been increasing throughout the world. So the bond market is wising up. But, uh, you know, to be fair, it's been slow. We haven't hit the suddenly and all at once point. Um, and that's, in my opinion, that's in the future. But um, the bond market, it'll get the message. I mean, Right now, actually, you know, there's an argument that maybe even though the Britain number is just printed very high, I think the U.S. might be looking at some lower numbers sometime relatively soon, uh, in which case they'll be able to say, hey, look, we've beat inflation and now we can go back to QE. Um, but they've, they've got a really big problem. I mean, you just when you look at the cliff of everything that's going to mature, you look at the deficits that we're running and you look at the QT that they're taking, you know, they're, they're selling bonds into the market. I mean, this is a this is a big train wreck coming. I, I think sooner rather than later. I well, I do too. Yeah, I think it, you can make the case. There's a few things to touch on here. One that we're in the eye of the storm, right? Because we had Silicon Valley Bank, First Republic, Signature, that whole domino effect happen a couple of months ago. Uh, things have cooled off quite a bit, but we're in the middle of Q2 here. We'll be done at the end of this month, and then we'll get Q2 financials end of July throughout August. And is that when the suddenly part begins, when uh, people become well aware of the fact that deposits have been leaving a lot of the regional banks over the course of the last two months and through this month, 
and the market only becomes aware of the gravity of that situation when the financials are released uh, Correct. end of July, early August. I call, this, I call this rivets popping, you know, and the original taper tantrum <laughs> was a rivet. And, um, you know, then, um, I don't know, there've been several, there've been a number of rivets that have popped. I mean, Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic was a rivet. They put it back together. Um, but there are more rivets coming and, you know, they keep putting fingers in the holes in the dike, but they're going to run out of fingers and the holes are going to come more quickly. So, you know, we can see it um, very clearly, some of us, uh, and, and know that it's coming, but that, you know, we, we've got to wait for each step to unfold. Yeah. And that's, that's another two other things I wanted to mention. Uh, it seems like the treasury knows it's coming as well. They announced earlier this year that they're going to open up the buyback program for treasuries Correct. in 2024, which means they're signaling that there's going to be a lack of demand that they're going to have to step in and, and yep. soak up. And then yep. number two, you look at the treasury's current account, which is draining. I believe we have a chart in the show notes that shows that it is at 37.4 billion right now. And before wow. Wow. The, the fed started raising uh, rates, it was around 400 billion. Um, and so the, the current account is getting drained rather quickly and that could yep. create a, a, a pretty bad liquidity crisis. And, and we haven't really gotten to the point where the economy hits the wall. I mean, you're seeing signs that it's hitting the wall in private equity in the banks and, um, some of the, some of the numbers, but you know, and, and the average household is, is addressing their shortfall in their, between their income and, and their costs by taking out credit card debt, but that's very expensive debt. And eventually people are going to realize that, you know, we're not going back to new all time highs in the market, the stock market. And, you know, people are going to start losing jobs. And so, um, you know, in the last couple of recessions, I mean, the, the tax receipts went down, you know, 10, 15 percent easily. And, and also a, a downturn triggers, you know, food stamps and a lot of the social spending has to go up in those downturns. So, you know, we could very easily at the peak of COVID, we were a four trillion dollar deficit. You know, as you mentioned earlier, we could be at as high as two nine this year. And this year ends in September, by the way. So we're only only one more quarter to go. Um, you know, I, I think next year could be, you know, easily over two two nine, maybe maybe in the three, three and a half range. And so, you know, that's uh, they're they're playing with fire here. Uh, and it you know, to me, it, I, I've used the analogy. They've got a clown car between and the driving the guardrails are massive inflation, massive deflation. They, they certainly hit the massive inflation one pretty well in 20 and 21. You know, they slammed on the brakes and we're now headed towards the massive deflation. And they they seem pretty intent. I, I thought it was interesting today, though. Did you guys see that uh, Tamaros, the Fed whisperer, came out and said, well, we may pause just for one meeting and then we'll come back at it if we need to. And he seems to be relatively well clued into what they're thinking of doing. So even though the CME futures are saying there's a 60 plus percent chance of another 25 bips in the June meeting, I think it's entirely possible that they pause. And, you know, my sense is that's going to ignite a fire underneath Bitcoin and, and gold and silver as well. So we'll have to see. I mean, they, they, they certainly know that there's an issue coming. Um, we know that. I, I know it from personal experience, knowing bankers, uh, several members of my family, extended family, work in the banking business and have pretty much been told to just stop making loans, you know, make sure everything's sound, batten down the hatches. You know, they, they can see what's coming. I mean, there's going to be, this is going to be a mess, a big mess. Uh, you know, and we got an echo bubble right now in NVIDIA and AI. And to me, that's just, that's just their most recent narrative. But that too will fade. Uh, it reminds me very much of 2000, actually. You know, and it's funny, I was short stocks in the top in 2000. I was actually a venture capitalist and trying to sell everything that wasn't nailed down. In March 2000, a lot of the really high flyers started to peak and drop. But the the Cisco's hung in there and the Microsoft's and all the big names hung in there. But late 2000, 2021, it really started to come unglued. So there's a lag, you know, in, in the monetary policy effect on the underlying economy. And my sense is that lag will hit us hard late this year, early next year. And we'll be looking at an entirely different set of problems. And the Fed is political. I mean, they react to the biggest problem of the day. The biggest problem of the day was inflation, you know, um, I could see very easily where the biggest problem of the day is going to become, you know, the punk economy, unemployment, et cetera. Right. Yeah. And that's actually another chart we have in the show notes, the living large chart, um, Logan, which highlights that maybe 
that lagging indicator is beginning to creep in when you take out the mega caps, the apples, Microsoft's, Amazon's, NVIDIA's from the S&P, the rest of the index is, is performing pretty, pretty poorly down more than 5% this year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, there's nothing good happening in this economy, in my opinion. It's, it's hanging on because there's a lot of free money out there sloshing around, but um, that's, that's being taken away. And, you know, and, and, the, and it's hidden this time in the, in the housing bust, it was very visible in the banks and very visible in everybody's house and their housing value. And so it happened quickly and, and very aggressively. A lot of the losses this time, they're hidden. They're in commercial real estate, which is in the regional banks. They're in private equity. They're in, in venture capital. I mean, you know, there must be venture capital marks that are just way, way, way overstated. And, you know, I think the private equity and venture capital market is $16 trillion. And as those marks start to get mark to market, you know, people are going to realize they're not as rich as they think they are. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of time until, you know, these things, our things start performing better than the alternatives, uh, which is to say the stock market. And, um, you know, then then we'll be in the all at once part, you know, soon thereafter. So I'm extremely bullish on what we've got for the next two years. I must admit this is, you know, I, I've been surprised at how long they've been able to fake out the market and keep things together you know, um, since they started the tightening in February. Logan, can you pull up the, the, the UK chart? Cause I think, uh, that kind of ties into a little bit what Larry was talking about earlier. It came out that for inflation for food and non-alcoholic, uh, uh, beverages, 20% for the year. And they're discussing, um, voluntary price controls. Uh, so quote unquote voluntary from the, um, you know, local. Wow. wow. Look at that. I didn't, I haven't seen that chart. Yeah, for essentials wow. there. So for anybody who's listening at home, we're looking at the UK annual inflation rate for food and non-alcoholic beverages, which has skyrocketed to 19.1%. And I mean, inflation is cooling down here a bit, but it, it is not isolated to the, the, the cooling down is not isolated to the US, obviously in other parts of the world, like the UK, it's running rampant. And in this highly interconnected global financial system, even if we can somewhat get our house in order here, there are externalities that exist abroad that could really throw a wrench in the Fed's plan uh, overall. Yeah, and I would say, go ahead. I, I, I would say a bit uh, because if you look, I don't think we're that far from that 19% here in the United States. I think it came out this week, like Costco basically said that they've had, there's been a decline in beef purchases and there's they're they're you know basically taking up majority of the shelf space with like pork and chicken um huh. so i th i think it's and then you talked about the credit card debt as well i think that we're not too far from from that number yeah there you go well we all know they cook the numbers i mean part of what makes this house of mirrors so hard to operate in is nobody you, you can't trust anything right <laughs> I, mean, I mean they make up numbers that suit them i mean the employment's num employment numbers the jolts numbers i mean it's it's uh, it's you know, we really are operating in a house of mirrors, and um, you know, the 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 powers that be are doing everything they can to hold it all together, and um, you know, I my my response to that is good luck. Um, yeah, I think by the um, by the shadow shadow stats is a, a wishy washy effort to show what the calculation formula for CPI from 1980 was, and like what right. what inflation would be using that version of the formula, which is the original version of the formula. Um, and it, it peaked at like 17% and it's down to 12% right now, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is 10% higher than, than what we're being told, uh, or almost 10% higher than what we're being told. Um, or the cost of our lives is increasing every year. And you can't trust those numbers at all. No, and I've actually been doing a quarterly monetary base update with, Matthew Mazinkius, and he, uh, he he believes that John Williams, who operates the shadow stats, has stopped like putting in as much effort. And so he recommends the Chapwood <laughs> Index, which we have here. And mm -hmm. this, the Chapwood Index uh, it reflects the true cost of living increase in America by major cities. So New York average um, wow. right now is 13.45. LA thirteen point five, wow. Chicago thirteen point two, Houston ten point one, Philly eleven point two five. Uh yeah, so all above ten percent San Jose sitting at fourteen point one. So if and Chapwood I believe just 
takes a basket of everyday goods that Americans actually buy and need food, groceries, gas, uh, rent. It does, it, does, it does beg the question of why anyone would hold any bond, you know, denominated yep. in any of the currencies. It's hard to make any money, uh, any real return in anything. Um, you know, the S and P you're, you're hoping for seven, 9%, uh, annualized, uh, but that's inflation right there. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that gets into the question. I mean, I know you've covered this a lot and this is your wheelhouse, which is gold and how that acts as sort of a leading indicator, uh, for Bitcoin, but also like a reacting indicator to what's going on here. And I saw Lynn Alden was tweeting earlier today on average gold tends to outperform stocks in two years after yield curve inversion. Um, and she has a nice chart there, um, yeah. that basically highlights where we are. Yeah, I mean, gold gold is more widely distributed than Bitcoin. Bitcoin, as you know, and uh, you know, as you know, I believe Bitcoin is far superior to gold. Um, but but gold gold is just less volatile. Bitcoin, uh, but, you know, gold is analog sound money. It's been around forever, and more people own it. Bitcoin is digital sound money. And it's got two things going on: the debasement of the currency and the adoption curve. So it's a much better bet than gold. But obviously, the drawdowns can freak out older people like myself. So. My clients aren't used to 70% drawdown, so, so I hold both. Larry, <laughs> did, you, did, you, Larry did you hear how uh, Bill Miller characterized um, Bitcoin versus gold? Uh, at, I, at Bitcoin I, I, I saw him out at the show, but I didn't see his speech specifically. What did he say? He said, uh, gold is just an inferior Bitcoin. That was his he's exact right. quote. Yeah, he's right. I mean, he's right. I mean, it's... Um, but it's not it's not going away tomorrow. I mean, there's the Lindy effect of gold. You know, six eight billion people know that gold has value. Sadly, you know, it's a subset of that that understand that Bitcoin has value. Um, yeah, I like to I think uh, Bitcoin is just gold that can fly. Well, that's right. Yeah, well, it's gold with better characteristics. I mean, it's superior in every in every way, shape, and form. But uh, it, it hasn't been as widely adopted. Um, and you know, if I were thirty years old, I'd be one hundred percent Bitcoin. But I'm not, you know, I'm about to turn 66. So my personal PA is half gold, half Bitcoin. And that gets to the question, like with all this going on, with the macro backdrop, debt ceiling, Fed pause on the horizon, how do we get the message of Bitcoin as a superior asset in the wake of all these crazy bond markets, uh, an equities market that looks like it's about to turn over and Bitcoin just sitting here, Larry, what, in your opinion, what is the message that we you need know, to get through to people? It's, it's number go up, it's user go up, it's use cases go up. And all of those things are happening. I mean, recall that the bottom was 15,000, it's now 27 or eight. Um, so it's beating gold this year. Um, the use cases are fabulous. I mean, look at you know Nigeria and, and all the countries around the world, all the people that are adopting it. Um, I think it's just overcoming the FUD associated with it. And, um, you know, to me, it's inevitable that it's going to happen. Um, there's a fixed supply, right? Yeah. I, I think that, you, go ahead. I was gonna ask, what are you seeing in the market? Like, as far as, I guess there's two parts. There's the folks that have been in the gold space, sound money space. Has the conversation or the narrative changed around an allocation, a small allocation of Bitcoin, and what you know? Oh yeah, some of the exposure. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I've 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 orange pilled a ton of gold bugs. In fact, I kind of see that as my role in this whole movement. And I think you know because I, I speak at gold shows still, and I always put in a plug for Bitcoin. And I I think you guys, I think I told you this. All you all know this, but maybe some of the listeners don't. When I go to a gold conference and I speak, one of the questions I always ask is. How many people in this room own Bitcoin too? And I would say it's generally been over half the hands and growing. So, um, you know, gold people are naturally disposed to understand the monetary debasement argument. That's why they're there. And, um, you know, um, the, the, you know, you must understand that from their point of view, some of them are like, well, Bitcoin is crypto and crypto is Sam Bankman fried and I'm not touching that shit. And, you know, if, if they haven't taken the time to do the work and dig beyond the bullshit, you know, you can see how they cursorily come to that conclusion. Um, and what I try to point out to them is that Bitcoin is in, Bitcoin is not 
Sam Bankman, Frieda Crypto. It's Bitcoin. Crypto is all bullshit. And what, what Bitcoin is, is it's an incredible technological innovation that completely changes the game. Um, never before in history have we had an asset, a commodity asset with a fixed supply. I mean, this is the only asset in the world where if the price went up 10x, the supply wouldn't change. Price of gold goes up 10x, we're going to mine a lot more gold. Price of oil goes up 2x, we're going to drill for more oil. Doesn't matter what happens to the price of Bitcoin, there ain't any more of it. <laughs> and so, so as long as the dogs keep eating the food, as long as the use cases grow, I mean, I often like to say, forget about number go up. I just want use to go up. If use goes up, number will go up too. And, um, you know, I, I actually do think, I mean, I know there are people who say, well, Bitcoin can't be manipulated. I actually think Bitcoin is to a somewhat, to some degree being manipulated. I, I think there are derivatives around Bitcoin that are starting to be a factor. I, mean, I think the people who are shorted are going to be run over. But um, I do think that, you know, I mean, as an example, I heard a pretty interesting theory that the last cycle was truncated. You know, we went to 68. We should have gone to 150. The reason we didn't go to 150 is that the Chinese banned it. And therefore, all those Chinese miners were forced into selling the coins they were hodling. And so there was a ton of supply that came on the market. And that's what truncated that run. That sounds logical to me. I, um, so, one that sounds even even more logical that's concrete is, you know, FTX and BlockFi. There's a lot of people short Bitcoin right now that thought they were holding whatever the number is, 50, well, that's, exactly right. yeah. that's exactly right. There was a lot of, I mean, didn't he claim to have, you know, $1.6 billion of Bitcoin and he had zero? I mean, it, you know, so. Yep. <laughs> he had $6 million Bitcoin. worth, $6 million. <laughs> oh, oh, <sorry. laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Some yeah, of us have that. <laughs> and Larry, the, the math on that uh, suggests that just from FTX alone, the amount of paper Bitcoin there uh, amounted to 25% of all the Bitcoin mined in the prior year. So, right. you know, if you're, if you're creating those, that, that paper Bitcoin, you're adding, quote unquote, adding supply. Correct. Uh, when or, it's or not actually supply. there. Yeah, somebody thinks they own a Bitcoin, they don't. They didn't go into the market to buy it. I mean, that's the game they've been playing with gold since forever. You know, there's a lot of paper gold and, and, and look, the fiat guys know that controlling the price of these two things is essential to their survival. Absolutely essential. So I think we're being naive if we don't think that they, you know, it, it hit their radar screen when it went to, when it did its five to 10,000 range and went to, you know, 50, 60 and what 21 and early 22, I mean, the, the alarm bells went off in every central bank in the, in the world. And they all said, holy shit. We got a real problem here, guys. Right. Well, let's talk about that. That's uh, the what is the Peter Thiel quote? The Bitcoin's the last fire alarm that exists. Yeah. Uh, it came out. It came out today or yesterday that Canada, like four of the major exchanges, left Canada because of some of the requirements after FTX. So I think the last one is Kraken. Sure. Uh, and and so you like extrapolate like capital controls and something you've always talked about that's that's fascinating because it makes sense as long as you're not naive is that. Um, based on what happened in 08 and what's happened previously, they're smart, they're clever, and they're going to you know, hit everyone at the knees when they're least expecting it. And so what does that look like when the price starts running away, when alternative assets start you know, taking whatever percentage from bonds, from the dollar? And it feels like directionally, I don't have it figured out. I'm curious if, if you have or anybody. It's like, where does the like, you know, quote, unquote, CVDC or programmable money that you can't move, but you need to live, and how does that tie into the flows uh, to be able to, you know, kind of just hinder the ability to get into an asset like that? Um, well, that, that feels like there's a play there. Yeah, Operation Choke Point was an obvious attempt at slowing down adoption and, you know, a, a blatant form of financial repression. And we know how they ran all that. I mean, we just set up the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. It was incredibly hard. We actually had to go to Canada to find a bank that was willing to, to bank fund just because so many of the banks in the US have been down on it. We, we've had people trying to transfer money to us and their banks saying, oh, if it's Bitcoin related, we won't do it. I mean, the pressure to kill this stuff is huge. I mean, you saw, you know, Caitlin being denied her, her banking permit um, as a result of Elizabeth Warren's, you know, leaning on the White House and, and, and shutting them down. I mean, look, the, the other side is fighting back. Let's not kid ourselves. And they probably have other weapons in their in their arsenal. I mean, I, I, you know, I've often thought that they might try to require for tax reasons. They might, you know, we already have to check the box in the U S and say you, you're dealing in crypto, which means you're much more likely to be audited. I think it's probably only a matter of time before they say, you know, you've got to tell us what your addresses are and how many coins you've got. 
You know, I mean, if, if, if I, you guys aren't old enough to remember it, but I have money in Switzerland and in Swiss bank accounts. And I have I've had to file a report every year for the last 20 years with a, with a group in Detroit that's part of the U.S. Treasury that says I have money in Swiss bank accounts and roughly how much I have. And so, you know, I think that's probably coming. Um, I think it's entirely possible at some point that they start to develop a narrative that these sound money assets are killing the American system and, and hurting the dollar and hurting fiat. And we're being anti-American and very much like in 1940, in the 40s, they, you know, buy war bonds because we've got to defeat the Axis. You know, and, and even though the war bonds paid well below the rate of inflation, people did it because they were patriotic. You know, they, they, they come at us and say, you know what, we don't want you guys doing this. And so we're going to put a 70 or a 90 percent tax on gains in Bitcoin and gold. And that would certainly slow things down. Right. I mean, none of us care because we're not selling or we're hodling. And, you know, and, and some of us have drawn black lines on the ground that say at some point, you know, I'm not sure I need to be an American citizen if they if they start to do that kind of stuff. But but I you know, I think we have to assume that they are going to do some shit that's going to be very detrimental or, or really, you know, take a swipe at us. I think we have to assume that. I, I know I do based on how I've seen them behave for 30 years. Yeah, and that's... It stinks to hear because yeah, it ideally... It really does. Right? That's well, the thing. Well, that, that, the flip of it is, though, it, it means that, that they're losing and there'll be a lot of people who go, hang on a second, why, are they, why do they care about this so much? You know what I mean? I mean, it's... That is yeah, like right. the Thomas Jefferson quote, like if a, if a law is unjust, it is right for you to disobey it. And I well, think it's that's right. And, and, you know, many of us are taking the Molon LeBay, you know, I got my 12 words, you know, sorry, government. Yeah, I got some Bitcoin. It's on this treasure and it's about one coin. Right. I mean, so, it's, you know, yeah. So to spin it a little, because you, you guys both are my spirit animals. And so I take that uh, internally, but on the other side, on the other side, because I know I initiated this is, it is on the pro side from Gensler to a lot of the draconian measures have been forced towards crypto, not necessarily Bitcoin. Um, from our experience, I think some of the banks don't necessarily know the difference, but if you're able to experience, explain it, Jesse and I were able for our fund, dude, we have like five bank accounts and they were pretty easy to get for, get through. So That's I think, um, yeah, I think, I think dependent on, yeah, and then also the other part was the presidential stuff that's happened with the different candidates that are trying to take a stand and scene, uh, and we're right. talking about the state, the state's autonomy. So I think that there is a, a push and pull from you know um, the absolutely US to be a place. So it's not all it's not all doing. We might. Be I, mean, I think one of the most encouraging things is the position that that you know RFK and and uh, DeSantis have taken on CBDCs. Right? Um, there's there's a big part of this country that understands what's going on. You know the the scandemic, all the other stuff. I mean, you know, uh, now I'm not saying the whole country understands it. The whole country obviously doesn't understand it. They they got caught up in a mass psychosis over the flu, but uh, but you know there, there there are some of us who do understand it, and uh, and it's not a small group. You know, it's it's getting larger and louder, and and you're seeing, you know, legitimate candidates uh, speaking the things that we have been saying, and that's. You know, they may not win, but that's, you know, that's, that's going to shift the window, right, of how people perceive things. Yes. So and, I think, all good. Yeah. and I think that, that, like, we talk a lot about the, the broader picture, but it comes down to, you know, an economy is made up of individuals, and you looked at that food chart of 20%, the way you beat that is you hold a better form of money. And so Correct. everybody here has been lucky enough to, to get into sound money and hold it, and their life is progressively gotten better. And so that's the idea. It's that you're holding this to protect yourself and your family. Um, and as we like propagate that thought and politicians learn about it, it's either there are people as well. So there is a narrative there. There's not only a narrative there, but there's also going back to something you said earlier, Larry, which is in today's day and age, the ability to run the banks is greater and easier than it's ever been with technology. You can literally go into a mobile phone app and remove money from your bank account within minutes. Piggybacking on that, and we saw it with SVB particularly, like the age of social media, like throws gas on that fire too, because you can get these oh, messages yeah. out there. They spread much quicker, much yeah. instantly, essentially. And that's what happened to SVB Thursday morning. The, the Peter Thiel email to Founders Fund companies leaked. And then by Friday morning, SVB was in receivership. And so- right. And, and so the power of social media is it's a double-edged sword. You have that where you can have a run on the banks pretty instantly. 
because of the information's ability to spread instantaneously. And then likewise with uh, an encroaching state, it also affords us the power to get the message out like, hey, the state is trying to clamp down on this because they have lost control like, to get the message out there. And so I think the, opti the optimist in me wants to believe that we do have the potential to avoid something like an executive order 6102 by leveraging communications technology that exists today. Hopefully Elon can hold the line with free speech on Twitter, but luckily we have budding uh, messaging protocols like Noster rising from the ashes of uh, the, the social media companies that have succumbed to censorship that, that give us the ability to keep spreading the message there if Twitter does fall. And so I, know, I feel like we're in this weird part of history with the digital age and the communications technologies we have at our fingertips that could lead to a positive outcome by just, I, I agree. I mean, I, I, you know, I just, I'm prepared for the, I'm prepared for their negative moves, but I think in general we're winning. And I think in general, the tools we have will allow us to prevail. And, and I think that, you know, um, when the next, when the next run starts, which, you know, I don't know when that will be. Um, but you know, at, at some point, the Fed will have to reverse course. Um, it's just mathematically a certainty because they don't want to have a Great Depression. And so when that occurs, you'll have another group of regular people saying, oh, my God, they can never stop printing. They've got to continue to print and our ranks will grow. I mean, our ranks are bigger than they were in 2017. You know, they're bigger than they were in 2019. And, you know, we will go through the. I mean, and I've got. I've got a ton of gold bugs who have bought their first Bitcoin, not a lot, but they have some. And when it goes to a hundred thousand, they're going to say, shit, those guys are right. You know what I mean? And, and I, and I don't have enough. I need more. And there's not that much available, you know, and we got the having coming in April of next year. So, you know, the available supply is going to decrease. Uh, it's, you can just see it coming. I mean, I, this is, this is the internet 2.0. I mean, I, I watched the internet. I, I remember Krugman saying it's a fax machine. I, I, you know, nobody believed it was going to spread the way it was going to spread. And yet those of us who were involved were like, you know, just wait, you know, I mean, just wait. I, I watched, I watched PCs. I mean, my in 1982, my first boss, you know, we had some PCs, some IBM PCs. He said, this is nothing but a glorified word processor, you know, an IBM Selectric is just as good as this. Who needs this thing? And I was kind of like, dude, you realize what this is going to do? You know, I mean, you have any idea? I mean, Microsoft came public at 14 times trailing. It was growing 40% a year. And they all they had done is they had repackaged MS-DOS and sold it to IBM. I mean, you know, it's, it's just, it's overwhelming. Dogs are eating the food. And so, I mean, this is, it's an absolute certainty. So on days when I get, you know, a little depressed, because maybe the trade on a short-term basis isn't going our way, um, you know, I, I sit back and, you know, you zoom out and you get the big picture. I mean, you know, this is an asset that in, you know, 2018 or 19, you could pick up for 5,000, 3,000, 5,000, $7,000. It's at 30, you know, no, it's not at 68. And if you bought it at 68 and you didn't dollar cost average, you feel like shit, but you know, I mean, there'll be a time when people say you bought Bitcoin at 30 or you have a whole coin. I mean, how many, I mean, really how many whole coins are available for purchase, you know? Um, as against 8 billion people in the world. And, you know, I don't know how many, I mean, there, there are 20 million millionaires. I mean, not, not, not even every millionaire in the world could have a whole coin. So, um, you know, and, and it's, it's demonstrably proven to be a better monetary solution than the alternative. So, uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's pretty damn obvious to me, <laughs> you know, the, the time scale, well, that's, you know, that's where long time preference helps. You know, um, I had, we had um, Safedine come to Boston in 2017 and talk to us. And uh, the, the biggest thing I took away from that was the, the long time preference, you know, just that um, you got to you got to you got to look out a ways. You, you can't you can't watch day to day. You know, I don't care. I don't wake up and look at the price of Bitcoin. I just don't care. Um, you, you, know. you said something there, Larry, that's super fascinating. It's like, I don't think we've seen a, a, a cycle that we all, I think, agree here that will happen as as, you know, having and supply declines that counterparty risk has been at the forefront on both sides so cool. on the like traditional fiat side you mentioned what would spark it is like the bank run and people recognizing that their money isn't safe uh, right. which is one component of like recognizing okay well there's about there's something valuable here 
we've always done this thought exercise or me and Marty have always talked about like, would you rather have $800,000 in Bitcoin or a million dollars in a bank? Like what's the number where you start to like, you know, where you rather actually know you hold the asset, you can take it with you. So that's like one attribute that I don't think had traditionally been on individual's mind of like money. And that could be a continuity for a business or just an individual. But then the other side is we've never had the, I think level, even with Gox happening, of understanding of counterparty risk on holding Bitcoin with an exchange. So we talked about the manipulation back in 2021, 2022. I think by definition, based on like what you're referencing on coins and, and just the fact that like exchanges have been draining, they still there's still Bitcoin there. At the next run up, we'll see the least amount of Bitcoin sitting on these exchanges uh, because people know what happened at FTX and BlockFi. So I, I think we're setting up for a very interesting. Uh, well, that's right. Episode. I mean. I you guys probably have the numbers. If you do, I'd love to hear them. But as, I remember reading some statistics about the number of coins that haven't moved in a long time. You know what I mean? The, the, the coins that you could consider hodlers who are just not going to sell them ever. You know, I mean, and it's, it's a big percentage. I mean, if you say there are 21 million coins and what, what do we estimate have been lost? Maybe two or three million at least, maybe more. Three million, yeah. Yeah, so call it three. So let's say there's 18 of available coins. It's a pretty big percentage of that 18 that hasn't moved in five years, isn't it? Do you guys know the numbers? I Is think that... it's like 65% ha haven't moved in like a year. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I think it's closer to 67. I'm looking right now. I know Unchain had it on their uh, hot okay, well, Let's say 30% of 18 is available, right? I mean, to move, so to yep. speak. I mean, it's what less is than that? 6 million coins. Yeah. 68.13%. 68, uh, I'll put it in the chat, Logan. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not that's not a huge number in the context of eight billion people and yeah. you know, 20, 20 plus million millionaires. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, mean, I, I think to, to what you were talking about earlier, I think there's a, a million addresses that have one whole coin or more. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that uh, I think that the, the, ad the addresses with less than a coin are currently gobbling up. They're currently stacking more than the rate that's being mined. Um, okay. So, and that's, and that's before the having. Right. So, you know. Yeah. And I think, and, and also, also to, to your millionaire point, um, I, I, so I've been following that statistic and of course you, how people define millionaire probably varies, but I've been watching that over, over just the last four years go from when I first started paying attention to it, I, I the number that I was following said 40 million millionaires in the world. And now okay. it's 60. 60 million okay. millionaires in the world. So just over the last four years, and, and, but of course that's because the, the measuring stick is broken and, and it's not actually that people are getting richer. Well, well, so if there's, I mean, you could be right. I mean, if there's 60 million of them, you know, not every one of them can even have a whole coin. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, so it, it's. Not every one of them could even have half a coin. <laughs> it's crazy. Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, so this, this thing is going to be, it's gonna it's gonna melt people's faces when it when it gets into the next run. It really is, and uh, it's 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 a difficult asset in the way that it trades. Though I mean, it's it's crazy because it it does these periods of. I mean, I remember doubling down at thirty five hundred in twenty nineteen, and you know it does these periods where it just doesn't do anything. It just sits there, and you're kind of like, what the hell, you know? But then and and then when it gets going, it's like it doesn't just go up twenty percent. It it goes up multiples, you know. So yeah. if if finding a base in the 20, 30, 40 range, and it does a five or a six X. I mean, you know, I, I fully expect we'll see 150 in the next run easily. Yeah. And right? that's yeah, easily. And that's one thing I want to bring up too, because this, this particular market reminds me of 2015. It was very boring. We went sideways right. for quite a while and it seems like at 27, wherever we're sitting right now, we're somewhere similar to where we were in 2015. And the one thing I've recognized just being around Bitcoin for 10 years now, and it's a bit cliche and people say it, is that building happens in the bear market and this bear market's no different. <laughs> and I would actually make the argument that in this particular bear market, the building that's happening in parallel to everything going on in the macro environment and the lull in the Bitcoin price movement is probably the most high leverage building that has happened in Bitcoin's history, particularly in the mining industry with the integration with the energy sector. I mean, I'm, I own part of a mining company. I'm sitting on the board of a mining company. And if you're in these conversations, the energy sector is waking up to Bitcoin mining, becoming an integral part of their stack that will help them be as efficient as possible with the resources they pull out of the ground or the electricity they're producing and as profitable 
as possible right. too. And with energy right. being the base layer of our society, if you get those key stakeholders in the energy sector keyed into Bitcoin and championing it, that is going to be not only a massive validation, but a, a cohort of people that defend Bitcoin from the government moving forward. Exactly. It's the most important sector exactly. in the economy, yeah. arguably. Yeah, there, there are people who say that really, the you know, you want to know how Bitcoin is doing, look at the hash, look at the global hash. And I've been just shocked at how big it's gotten. I mean, we now know that Russia is participating in a big way. Um, and, you know, I actually think behind the scenes, you know, America might even be doing something as well. Um, but yeah, it, as the hash continues to grow, the network gets more and more secure. And everybody who's involved in that, you know, has a role in defending it. And so... You know, as I say, it's, you know, there's just, there are a lot of dogs eating food. There's a lot of momentum behind it. You know, um, it's almost like, you know, don't, don't really think too much about the price, recognize what it is and recognize what it's likely to become. And, you know, we'll look back at, these are the good old days when you could buy a coin for 30,000 because that's not going to be available in the future. Yeah. And Logan, if you want to pull up the hash rate chart, I think it's important. Zoom out to three year, please. Um, because I think this is just an incredible chart to highlight because right. if you look look back at that decline in July of twenty twenty one during the China oh, wow. ban, that's like a blip on the chart now. We're we're right. wow. We're more than right. three we're almost three X above. Or excuse uh, me, right. two and a half X above. I remember that dip really looking like the sky was falling. Like you know, there was genuine concern mid twenty twenty one um that there was some doom loop going on with the Bitcoin hash rate and miners would all capitulate down to zero. And now on this chart, it's such a minor footnote in, in the upward trajectory of this thing. Yeah. Well, and, and, go ahead. Go ahead, Marty. Well, was gonna, to your point, Jesse, this is a big um, opportunity to teach newcomers to this show who are trying to learn about Bitcoin, that mining death spiral is a meme that com that comes around anytime the hash rate falls significantly. They think, oh, miners are falling off the network. What's going to secure the network? But the beautiful thing about Bitcoin is it has a difficulty adjustment. So every right. 2016 blocks or roughly every two weeks, the network does a backward look at how quickly or slowly blocks are being produced. And if they're being produced too slowly above 10 minutes, then the difficulty adjusts down to make it easier to mine, to incentivize and more profitable to mine to make it to incentivize miners to turn back on and begin producing blocks. And alternatively, if blocks are coming in at less than 10 minutes on average, the difficulty will just up to get it back towards that 10 minute target, make it a little bit harder to mine. Yeah, it really is an ingenious system. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitive time and it's definitive energy. Um, and I, I hope, I'm sure you guys have listened to it, but I, I was absolutely blown away by the, what is money uh, with sailor that he did at the, at the show. It, it's one of the more recent ones. And also with the one with, with Jason Lowry, um, you know, it's, it's just so obvious to me that, that, you know, that energy really is what runs the world and that energy is the natural discount rate. And, you know, Bitcoin is pure digital energy and this will become obvious to everybody in the future. It's not obvious right now, but those who don't see it and don't participate in it, are going to be at a significant economic disadvantage to those of us who do see it and are willing to bet on it and support it. I mean, I, I saw a tweet recently talked about, you know, imagine being able to buy Manhattan real estate in 1800. I mean, that's, that's kind of what we're looking at here. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's the base layer and, you know, the, the transaction fees might get very high. I mean, I thought it was very interesting the way the transaction fees went up recently with, you know, the NFTs, and the ordinals and some of that stuff. But, and that's a preview of coming attractions. I mean, there will come a day when the average person isn't able to afford or doesn't want to do an on-chain transaction because on-chain transactions will be just too expensive. And that's okay. That's the way it should be. Yeah. And it goes back to what we were saying earlier, building happens in the bear market. And again, in this bear right. market, the progression of second layers, particularly the Lightning Network, uh, we had the launch of Fetty. Fetty Mints, excuse me. Fetty is a, a company that's creating a front end on Fetty Mints, which is a new right. second layer solution. We had Barack uh, just announce his ARC protocol, which won't come anytime soon. And some updates to the Bitcoin Core consensus code, but that's another option that we'll have. Liquid, which is Blockstream's uh, second layer solution, you know, federated right. option as well, is actually beginning to get more traction. And so mm -hmm. the 
scaling of Bitcoin at the transactional layer will happen above the base layer where it will simply be too expensive for your average Joe to, to spend a UTXO because the congestion and the, the demand to get into blocks will be so high. Um, but we are working on second layer solutions to make it very easy to spend Bitcoin instantly and relatively cheap. Correct. Yeah, no, it's, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. And I, you know, I, I'm just, I'm very encouraged by it all. I'm, and I'm very bullish on the future for it. I mean, I just, you know, it, it's, um, it gives me a lot of hope. Um, and you know, the, the government and the fact that the governments can't see it, you know, what would you expect? Right. I mean, this is a sclerotic broken system, um, that's, you know, trying to hang on to its privilege and they're just not going to succeed. Um, yeah, you that- know, it, go ahead. So uh, that that chart, uh, it, what doesn't show up in the charts, but we experience daily is like the human capital coming into the space as well. Like the people yeah. actually building, the people leaving some of the best like top tier organizations or the, the crypto bubble and realizing what's happening. And they're not general individuals that's generally submit an application and let it, they're, you know, heartfelt, passionate, you know, people that are, are trying to further a cause and that you don't get that priced in. Um, and so it's just been exciting, like very you hadn't seen it before uh, this like lull where there's just so many things being worked on right now that we know once the price and just kind of adoption goes, there's going to be a lot of tools that didn't exist previously. Yeah. yeah my f- yeah. my yeah. favorite description of Bitcoin is digitals. It's the digital uh, Galt's Gulch. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Whether it be the human yeah. capital coming over, well, certainly the human capital coming over a bunch of people who work in traditional tech, traditional banking, traditional finance, there are a lot of Bitcoiners in those sectors that really have had the light switch go off in their minds and feel a a drive to come work on Bitcoin and to further the cause, like Michael said. And like you said, Larry, the government does not understand what's going on. And we're in our little digital Galt Gulch building out the future. And hopefully we're successful in building that future. And, and it creates the potential for the, the soft landing that Jerome Powell thinks he can create. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. Um, this stuff is going to save the world. It really, it's going to save the world. And, um, and that's a good thing. It's a very good thing because the world needs saving right now. I mean, uh, we've, we've hit, we, we've hit peak fiat, you know, we, we already hit it and we're over the peak and we're coming down the other side. And so now we're just, you know, it's, I mean, if, if you're if you believe in the fiat system, you're just definitely on the wrong side of history. It's like it's like being a loyalist in you know America in 1789. I mean, or 1776. I mean, you're just you're going to get fucked. I mean, you're just, you know, and uh, um, I mean, there are plenty of other you know phase transitions that you know that are similar. I mean, you know, if you're the Catholic Church and you you know you say only your scribes can transmit the Bible and only your people have the power to interpret the word of God and then Luther, you know, nails up the thesis and then Gutenberg gets the press going and, you know, guess what? That's not the way it really is. And so this thing is, it's going to change the world in a really positive way. And that's what I'm very excited about. And I just want to be here to see it um, and, and do everything I can to participate in it. Cause I think earlier when he asked Chris, what can we do? I mean, I think the only thing we can do is, is be very loud and proud and, and helpful to those who don't see it and don't understand it and try to explain it to them and try to try to get the word out. And, um, you know, I mean, it's the, our numbers keep growing and, you know, I mean, there, there are those of us who are doing it now and in five or 10 years, it will be multiples of, of us doing it, you know? And, and uh, yeah. so it, it just, and, and then at some point it'll look like it was obvious all along, you know, but <laughs> But we're not at that stage yet, at least not with most people. Yeah, so. I think I think at this stage, you still get to put a small signature on the Declaration of Independence if you're a part <laughs> of this like community, being vocal, being loud, and trying to promote this cause. And then, of course, you know, <laughs> a century from now, it'll, it'll feel like everybody was lining up to put their name on the Declaration of Independence. But that was that was a small group of people who were not going to stand well, for it. It really was. I mean, you know, we owe we owe an incredible debt to people like Safetine who wrote that book that, you know, taught all you guys Austrian economics. I mean, I was, you know, I knew Austrian economics 25 years ago. But when I, yeah, there you go. When I bring yeah. it up, 
when I bring out, I say Von Mies, and people look at me like I, you know, had two heads and like I was crazy. You know, I, I, uh, I, I got a, I got a Stanford MBA, and and I've told Safe that um, with one book he undid my Stanford MBA. <laughs> right. <laughs> Out the <Yeah>. window. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, it's when I mean, the Keynesian. It's just it's a it's a broken it's a flawed model. It's a completely flawed model, and that we, you know, our grandkids will say, I can't believe you guys let the government have control of something as important as the price of money. I just can't believe you, you did it. But but I get it. You know, you, you corruption, the Fed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. And then I just anecdotally, I've had many instances in my personal life of individuals who I've been talking to about Bitcoin, friends, family, that have sent me pictures of the Bitcoin standard. Like, all right, I'm finally d- diving in. And then conversely, older individuals in my life who are at retirement and ready to go. And they have a lot of their retirement money in these retirement accounts that had target date funds that shifted their whole retirement to the 80, 20 bond stock allocation oh, yeah. that are sitting yeah. there looking at that dissolving right in front of them and having yeah. the, the light bulb go off. Like, Oh, this is not what I thought it was going to be when I retired. That's a big problem uh, that many people aren't aware of is those target date funds and how underwater a lot of them are I recorded a TFTC episode with Matt Dines earlier this week where we really dove into it. And it's, a scary problem when you think about it. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's sadly so many people are going to be deprived of their life's effort as a result of a criminal system, you know, diluting it through printing money and really stealing their money. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's criminal. And it's tragic. I mean, it's in the same way that a lot of people worked for companies, they thought they had a pension and, you know, the pension was cut and then the company failed and, and, you know, private equity took it over and levered it up and it went bankrupt. And, you know, private equity guys did great, but they, you know, their pension disappeared. I mean, you know, the 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 rule of law in America, I mean, the, the founding documents of America were so beautiful. Um, and yet we've never really lived up to them. Um, and we've progressively abused them. You know? And I think I think we reached peak abuse, you know, post 1971 and, and all the way up to 2008. And and, and it continues, frankly, it continues. But, you know, we've got an alternative system now. And it's like Bob Mises said, I mean, they, they can't stop it. You know, they don't like it, but they can't stop it. And uh, and we're going to take it away from them because people aren't stupid. And they're going to once they realize that this is the right choice, they're going to they're going to join us. All of them. You know? Yeah, Larry, that, that's, that's a big part of this pod is like helping bridge that gap from the digital asset, quote unquote, crypto, Bitcoin curious into right. like what, it, what is happening here? How does it apply to traditional finance? And something that I learned recently, and I kind of in, in, intuitively knew, but it's really come to light is like financial advisors and wealth managers, the incentive model is just absolutely horrible for oh. anybody that's made wealth in their life to be taken care of or be pushed in this direction. From absolutely. the CY, CYA asset accumulation to even if you do get a sub 5% allocation, then they want you to rebalance. It is just like, it's criminal because people are yeah. trusting and they they made their money. They give it all to them. They give them the yeah. autonomy to make it. And now they're just sitting there on this thing that's losing them 10% and they're, they can't retire or their retirement is yeah. much less right. than what they want. You mean, you mean you're not listening to Susie Orman? <laughs> <laughs> Like, there's people in the crypto space that do that. I mean, and that are crypto financial advisors that have the same thing: diversification across ten different or, basket or, of assets. Or Dave, or Dave Ramsey. I mean, you know, it's you know, or CNBC. I mean, come on. I mean, it's just it's uh, these people are pissing on our leg, and they say it's raining. I mean, it's just it's it's horrible. <laughs> it's absolutely horrible. I mean, it you know, it, it just um, you know. The good news is, you know, we do have critical thinkers in this country. And, and you know, um, I think people, when presented with evidence, often come to the right conclusion. I mean, I have many people I've orange pilled who started off being vehemently against it. And, uh, you know, in, unless unless they're, you know, abusive, my view is I won't give up on anybody, you know, as long as I think I can you know, ultimately convert them. I had a guy, a really good friend from my CrossFit gym. We went out to, I, I, was, I saw him the other day. And we went out to a, a breakfast back in 2017 when, or 2019 when it was at 3,500. And he said, I want to give my kids a Christmas presents. And I've got, he's a rich guy. I've got about 3,000 to spend on each kid. I said, give them a Bitcoin. And one of the kids was there. The kid worked for Goldman Sachs. And um, uh, the guy said, no, I'm not going to give him a Bitcoin. That's bullshit. And the kid said, I wouldn't want that. If, if you gave me that, I'd sell it right away. 
And um, I saw that guy for lunch about a month ago. And I said, hey, do you remember that breakfast we had where we talked about Bitcoin? He says, yeah, I rub my kid's face in that every time I see him. Goldman Sachs kid. That was the same Goldman Sachs kid that told me uh, it was transitory back in 2021. That was what they were telling their... Uh, yeah, their, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's... Okay. Yeah, fine. You had a chance to have one for 3,500 bucks. You didn't take it. Good. That was a good move. I mean, it, it's, you know, everyone gets it at the price they deserve. And so, um, people need to do the work. And once they do the work, once they think it through to its logical conclusion, and it's hard, it's hard to think out, you know, years and decades and generations. I mean, I, you know, in the twenties when, you know, my grandfather was driving his Ford model T, I'm sure he couldn't foresee that, you know, We'd have roads all over the country and families would own multiple cars and the cars wouldn't break down and, you know, they'd be, they'd be a fabulous form of transportation, you know, um, but, you know, you could see that, um, I mean, you know, and, and this thing, I mean, it, it is somewhat clunky still. I mean, it's not, you know, for, I mean, self-custody as an example is scary to a lot of people, people, particularly people my age, you know, um, but it's, it's not unsolvable. It's not undoable as we all know. And, um, you know, and, and as I say, I, I, I've seen a lot of people be converted and, um, you know, it's, it's an idea whose time has come. And so therefore it will win. I mean, it, to me, it's just, uh, I've never been so sure of something. So, um, you know, it, it's as Marty, I think it's Marty actually always says, you know, relax, we'll win, you know, and, uh, and we will. So, you know, I, I wish we'd win a little faster. You guys have a longer ramp to see the outcome. <laughs> I, I want to see. I want to see the outcome sooner rather than later, because I think the world is a lot better on the other side of, of hyper Bitcoinization. Um, you know, I think a lot of things, a lot of the problems we have, disappear, uh, and a lot of the frauds and charlatans. You know, we can't do that shit anymore, uh, and so you get paid for actually doing honest work. You get paid for doing the right thing. Um, the only way to, you know, the only way to add value is to add it honestly, and then save honestly and, and those people who save will be rewarded as opposed to those people who spend and, and, and you know, play around in fiat. And tying this back to the Fed conversation with what they're going to do with rates, who knows if they pause or whatever. I mean, that's, and tying it into things being better on the other side of hyper Bitcoinization. What Bitcoin really does is just bring opportunity costs back to markets, which the Fed has completely corrupted with right. their control of the Fed funds rate, which distorts the pricing mechanism, <clears throat> which is the money of the world and leads to capital misallocation. And a lot of this, the zombie companies that we see throughout our economy and the, exactly. I mean, uh, we, you know, given all the technolo technological developments that we've had, we should be living much, much better lives and we should be doing much, much more intelligent stuff. And, you know, we, I mean, when you get the cost of capital wrong, then the wrong projects get supported, the wrong things happen, electricity is too expensive. I mean, you know, we should have nuclear power everywhere, um, you know, and I mean, we, we should all be given, given how much innovation there's been in the last 30 years, we should all be living at much, much higher standards of living. But we don't and we haven't because the money's broken and therefore the system We've wasted a lot of savings and money on stuff that doesn't make sense well, because it's not, it's not priced appropriately. Well, that's the really frustrating and somewhat nefarious part of the narrative that's fed to us, which is look at, look at you four. You're in four different cities across the U S streaming over the internet, using cameras, using microphones. Uh, the internet's cheap. The monitor that you're looking at is relatively cheap. The quality of life has never been better. The services have never been better. It's particularly nefarious because if you look at the statistics here in the US specifically, I mean, you have the life expectancy of men falling. You have deaths of despair at all time highs, overdoses, um, yeah. suicides. Yeah. It, it's, it, it, we may have the ability to do this live stream and to speak into these mics and access the internet re relatively cheaply, walk around with supercomputers in <coughs> our pockets, but that is all in spite of the, the despair that is around us as well. And so you right. can look at some metrics like the, the cost of technology particularly, but and try to paint a rosy picture there, but you have to look at the whole picture. And if you look at the whole picture, there is a lot of despair that I would argue, and I'm sure the three of you would argue as well, stems from the fact that we've corrupted the money and created this perverse incentive throughout our economy. 
Uh, yeah, Larry, so you, mentioned, you mentioned venture and like the mark to market. There's a, a, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, there's a guy, Eric Newcomer. He was at the information. He's like a Silicon Valley insider and he recorded a pod. Yesterday it came out with a guy, Kyle Harrison, who's a venture capitalist at a firm called Con- Contrary Capital. And they basically talk and they don't even, they don't know the answer. They don't know it's the money, but they're basically just explaining how you think about, uh, I think Daro from Uber said, you know, their unit economics have never, you know, been profitable. They're this, you know, multi-billion dollar firm. I don't even know the number of people. I think it's probably 10 to 30,000 people work for that company. Never turned a profit. And that they're thinking about finally like batting down the hatches and thinking about profitability and just thinking through what are the number of companies that have either been ruined or shouldn't exist by the amount of capital that was thrown their way. And you extrapolate that to the people working at them, the, you know, you think about like the centralization of a Facebook or Google and, you know, you have the best data scientists working on just engineering that one extra click or that, you know, extra million clicks of that, you know, particular thing versus some of the stuff you talked about in the innovation side. Um, so yeah, once you get down to the incentive model, the, the opportunity cost and how clearly like loose monetary policy has like pushed people in directions that they should never have been, it just unravels right. a whole rabbit hole of like, what could oh, we yeah. have been doing in the past 50 to hundred years and where would we be? Yeah, we'd, we'd, be in a, we'd be in a much better place. And the sad part is nobody can see that or very few people can see that. You know, yeah. uh, We were supposed to have the Jetson car and instead we got the Tesla car. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, um, I don't know. The, to me, actually, the, the, uh, the biggest bee in my bonnet, particularly after listening to Sailor talk about it, I mean, energy runs the world, right? If you, you've all seen the curve of how, we, you know, how much energy it takes to keep 8 billion people in a decent lifestyle or alive. And the fact that we've ignored what is demonstrably the clearest, highest ROI form of energy, which is nuclear power. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't even begin to imagine how many people have died and suffered as a result of not solving that problem. Do you know what I mean? I mean, I'll give you a perfect example. I mean, electric cars in Massachusetts, I mean, I have a hybrid car. It doesn't even make sense to plug it in for the hybrid. It's a, you know, it's hybrid electric with battery. It'll go 30 miles on the battery. The electric cost here in Massachusetts is 31 cents uh, per kilowatt hour. You know how high that is? It's insane. <laughs> it, I mean, unless gasoline's eight or nine dollars, it does not make sense for me to plug in my electric hybrid wow. here in Massachusetts. Yeah. And why is that? Because Massachusetts won't allow a power line to bring five cent power down from hydro Quebec and it won't allow a gas line to come out of Pennsylvania to bring in cheap gas from Pennsylvania. So we have to bring our power in, in forms that are very expensive that lead to 31 cent energy. And, you know, it's easy to say, well, you know, whatever people seem to get by in Massachusetts, but do they really, I mean, does the, does the family that's paying $300 for an electrical bill and, and, and that, you know, they're not making much money. So that really eats into their ability to buy just basic food. I mean, is that, is that really a good thing? Yeah, you know, it's terrible, right? That's yeah, terrible. And I just put a chart in the show notes that we'll pull up here. This is the Henry Adams curve, right? And so it's the actual energy usage versus what it arguably should be if you want to uh, increase energy production with population growth and have the quality of life and increase in quality of life that, that we experienced throughout the first uh, between 1800 and funnily enough, around 1971. And so this chart, what just highlights is that the energy use per capita has gone sideways since the 70s. And again, this could be uh, right. multi-factored, the, the, the unwillingness to let nuclear proliferate, and then to the misallocation of capital that's throwing right. money at tech startups instead of critical energy infrastructure. Exactly, correct. I mean, it's just, it's, uh, the, whole thing is, the whole thing is really broken. You know, we, and we need, we need people who understand it, engineers who understand. We need Sailor to be head of the National you know, Energy Society and, and to be advising the government on what we should be doing. If, if we want to have better standards of living, which is, I think, what really all of us are looking for. We want to we live well. We want our families to prosper. You know, we want to have houses that are heated. We want electrical that's cheap. We want to have food that's decent. You know, to have all of those things, you have to have efficiency. And uh, fiat is anti-efficiency. Sound money drives efficiency by its very nature. Um, but but that that thought pattern, Keynesians have lost that because they're all about growth and animal spirits. 
and growth at any cost. And, and that's just all, that's all wrong. It's just, it's completely wrong. I mean, and Keynes was an evil guy. I mean, apart from the fact that he was a pedophile, you know, I mean, the, the notion that, you know, the notion that he was, the notion that, that he, um, you know, that, that in the long run, we're all dead, which is more like saying, oh, let's, screw our, let's, screw, you know, let's party on and screw our grandkids, right? I mean, you know, fuck you. I mean, I, you know, no. And yeah, in the long run, I am dead, but I want to leave behind a world that's better for my kids and grandkids, you know, and not just party today in some debt fueled orgy so that, you know, everything can collapse later. I mean, it's, there's got to be a sustainability argument here somewhere. And the Keynesians just totally miss that. Yeah, of course, Keynes didn't have any kids or grandkids for that matter. So he That's really right. didn't care. He was dead. He had nothing. Yeah. Nobody. He was leaving behind the mess too. So he wiped his hands yeah. and left it with the rest of us. Exactly. And, you know, I mean, it's, um, it's an evil, it's an evil thought pattern that these people are involved in. And, but it, you know, it's, it's great if you're a statist. I mean, it does give a lot of power to people in the state and some people really enjoy that power. You know, psychopaths do. And, they're going to do what they're going to do. Um, but, you know, here we are, we got a system that's going to fight it. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us to try our best to push the system forward as fast as we can, because in my view, it's definitely the, the right way to, you know, it's, it's the legacy I know I want to leave, which is, you know, fought for a better system. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll emerge. I'm, I'm not too worried that, I mean, whether I fight for it or not, I think it's going to emerge, but, I'd like to see it emerge faster. That's why I'm fighting. <laughs> Definitely commend you for uh, being that bridge. I don't think it's an easy, it may seem like Jesse was saying in retrospect, we'll, you know, we'll look back at, oh, that was an easy thing, but being the gold guy to help uh, lead the the, well, the torch and talk great, about Bitcoin. Yeah, some of the Bitcoiners take the view that, you know, there can only be one and by supporting gold, I'm, I'm not supporting Bitcoin. And I, I say that's bullshit. I, I mean, I, I think... I mean, you know, to me, I think I've said this before, you know, gold is the gold's the gateway drug and, you know, Bitcoin's the heroin and we want to get them addicted to heroin. But, you know, sometimes sometimes you got to bring them, sometimes you got to bring them through the gateway drug. Right? As a 70 year old, isn't going to go right to Bitcoin. I mean, I, you know, I try and get them interested in sound money. And, and if they want safe, sound money, I say gold. Then, OK, once you got that, now let me show you how to really make money. And that's Bitcoin. So, um, you know, I would never advise buying Bitcoin over gold. But I'll take a gold bug and try an orange pill them every day of the week. Um, so, and I, and I, think, I think anything that drains fiat is helping our cause. I mean, I, it, you know, I think you either are buying and saving in fiat, which means you're supporting a broken system, or you're buying and saving in sound money. And you know, one is a better form of sound money, Bitcoin. But but I, I'd much rather have somebody buy gold than than buy bonds. I mean, you know, you're, with bonds and fiat, you're supporting a broken, warmongering, corrupt system. By buying sound money, you're saying, you know, I'm draining their system. I don't want to play. I'm not playing your game. You know, fuck you guys, government. I'm not going to play your game. Yeah, I don't and, think you can understand Bitcoin without understanding gold, right? And then if you buy well, a little along the, the way, because, I mean, by understanding Bitcoin, you have to understand money. And gold was money for a very long time. Well, that's right. I mean, it, look, you know, before 2008, it was the only alternative we had, right? And uh, and it's still, for some people, it's not a terrible alternative. I mean, it. it it will not lose its value. It will it will lose its value relative to Bitcoin, but it will hold its value uh, as opposed to fiat. I know that. So, yeah. Do you think um, Do you think that most people are still in a sixty forty portfolio? And yeah. do they do they do those people have to go through gold to get to Bitcoin, or do you think that there's like a, a narrative, a path, some other? like way they can talk themselves into Bitcoin being having value. Oh, I think, I don't think you need to go through gold at all. I think you can go right to Bitcoin. I know a lot of people who have, and who just get it. And they're kind of like, well, if I'm going to sound money, why, why even screw around with gold? I'm going to skip that step. So um, I, the, the reason to hold gold versus Bitcoin is if you can't handle the drawdowns. I mean, mm -hmm. think about it. You're 70 years old. You got $10 million. You know, you don't want to wake up one morning and have your 10 million be three. I mean, it's going to freak you out. You know, now, if you dollar cost average, that's it's less likely to happen. But the point is, we have seen recurring large drawdowns in Bitcoin. And when as you get later in life, you need to, you know, you don't want to suffer those drawdowns. That's disturbing, so to speak. So, um, you know, so what to me, gold is just less volatile sound money. And Bitcoin is I mean, it, I actually view it as 60, 40, you know, kind of do that portfolio where gold is your bond and, and Bitcoin is your equity. Right. I mean, it's. Uh, 
That's you know, the way gold, to be, yeah. You're right. Gold, gold, I mean, the, the biggest drawdowns ever in gold have been kind of 20, 25% a year. So, you know, and most people don't like 25% drawdowns, but you can hold them. And if you look at gold over long periods of time, even though it's underperformed, Bitcoin, over long periods of time, it's kind of compounded 8 or 9% a year. And that's in spite of being suppressed massively. So, you know, 8 or 9% a year is not bad. It's not great, but it's not bad. Um, so to me, you know, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a less volatile sound money alternative with Bitcoin being the far superior alternative. But yeah, you can skip gold. And I, like I said, if I were 30, I wouldn't own any gold. You know, um, yeah. I think I, I saw somebody said recently um, uh, that, you know, looking ahead over the next few decades is going to be uh, um, gold for central banks uh, and Bitcoin for the people. Do you think that we're going to see kind of a, a skewing of a self-selecting of, of, you know, who, which asset well, makes sense for which demographic? Yeah, I, I think central banks will ultimately have to embrace Bitcoin. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, the soundest money does always win, ultimately. And and I think that, I think that central, I mean, however, having said that, you know, I'm not even sure we'll really have central banks. I mean, I think there's a possibility. I mean, what's a central bank? Do we really need one? I mean, it, you know, if, I mean, think about it. If we have hyper Bitcoinization, why do you need a central bank? I mean, Bitcoin's your central bank, really. And why does the government need to have, you know, I mean, a government should be able to, they should, they should tax what they need for, you know, to keep the system fair and they should spend to run the courts. And that's about it, in my view. I mean, that to me, to me, the only role, I mean, I'm not a complete anarchist, but to me, the role of government ought to be to try as a referee to keep a, le a level playing field. So they ought to maintain law and order. They ought to, you know, have court systems and, and rules and laws so that, you know, psychopaths get punished and, murderers go to jail and Sam Bankman free gets caught and all that kind of stuff. But other than that, I don't really see much of a role for government. And my sense is we all, if we all paid five or 10% of our income, um, you know, forget all the transfer payments, forget all the retirement, all that stuff, let people be responsible for their own lives. Um, the government would be perfectly capable of doing that on a, on a modest charge to the rest of us. And we'd be willing to pay it because you know, we, I, I know, I don't know what you guys, I want a court system. I want laws. Yeah. You know, I, I want, I want, I want guys who are murderers to get thrown in jail. You know, um, it's, so. it's, that's it's, entirely sensible, too sensible. Right. You know, I think we see the average American increasingly want more and more government, um, which yeah. sort of lends itself to the, right. the possibility that we're heading towards Weimar before people figure out that we can't just. Yeah. meet all of our needs that we that we would love to you know all the all the safety net that any average person wishes is could be there um they're gonna have to lose it the hard way yeah very, very possibly yeah no and it's funny as the government gets bigger and they get more control and less accountability what you find is you actually end up with kangaroo courts <laughs> where they can well, just do right. whatever that's they right. want to whoever they want um, well, that's because they're exactly so large right. Yeah, they, they change, they bend the rules to support the people in power and people in power have the money. I mean, it's a circular system, right? I mean, fiat, you know, we've got a fiat government, um, you know, and they're all, I mean, how, how does Elizabeth Warren get a $60 million net worth, you know, making 285 grand a year? I mean, you know, is Janet Yellen worth $7 million in speaking fees? I mean, it's just, it's a joke, right? I mean, we, these people are all whores that have sold our rights and, you know, our, our, our natural born rights are being sold to the highest bidder and the highest bidder are the fiat guys who get at the cotillionaire money trail first and they can borrow at 0%. I mean, you know, Ken Griffith has a $250 million penthouse in New York because Ben Bernanke is his advisor. And, you know, when his risk parity trade went tits up in, you know, March of 2020, Bernanke called the Fed and got him a swap line and he lived. He should have been bankrupt. You know, I mean, we get, we get Lloyd Blankfein holding forth on Twitter about, you know, military matters. I mean, he, he should have been bankrupt. You know, Goldman Sachs and AIG both should have failed. He should have been out of a job, full stop, you know, and some other bank would have come along and replaced Goldman that was more honest, you know, but instead he's got a $60 million house in the Hamptons, you know, and he holds forth on Twitter about military matters. I mean, you know, and all these wars would stop, right? I mean, who's going to pay for them? I mean, I don't want to kill 3 million, China. I don't want to kill 3 million Vietnamese rice farmers, but, you know, Henry Kissinger did and Richard Nixon did and we did. We killed 3 million Vietnamese people in my lifetime. I mean, what the fuck? I mean, that's half of the goddamn Holocaust. 
Do you know what I mean? Why? Because of a domino theory that if South Vietnam went communist, you know, our lives would change. And it would be a very dangerous thing. Well, how did that work out? You know, <laughs> we went off the gold standard to pay for it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we went off the gold and we went off the gold standard to pay for it. Right. So it's, you know, this is a this is an incredibly broken and fucked up system. And it's and we got to fix it. We absolutely have to fix it. Oh. You know, and, and it's how money will fix it. Fix the money, fix the world. Right, Marty? Yes, sir. We're going to win. And yeah, to tie it up, tie this conversation up with a actionable solution. There's many of you out there who are new listeners to the pod, to new podcast who are just listening to the podcast and we're catering towards like a high net worth individual investor class. <clears throat> and you may be listening to this like, all right, these guys are just talking crazy anti-government. Like what is an actual, an actionable like Bitcoin product outside of like just holding it that that would make sense to me and tie this back to the conversation I had with Matt Dines earlier this week about the retirement account funds and that 80, 20 bond stock split that most retirees are sitting at now. Uh, a lot of them, if they don't want to touch Bitcoin directly, there are products being developed, particularly by Matt and build that get them credit exposure where they don't have to buy Bitcoin directly, but it ties into Unchained's lending desk where Right. Unchained has a great lending desk where uh, it's over collateralized, 40% LTV. Uh, the escrow account is a multi-sig wallet where the borrower holds one key, Unchained holds one. Kingdom Trust, very similar to the on-ramp model um, of, of distributing that multi-institutional uh, risk, distributing that risk between multi-institutions. And so for the institutional investor, like, oh, like how can I get exposure to Bitcoin? There's ways to get exposure via credit if you go to build, give them money. They funnel it to Unchained's lending desk. It's over collateralized. You're getting like a 14% APY uh, and you can roll that up into your retirement account instead of sitting on treasuries that are losing money. And this product works because Bitcoiners don't want to sell their Bitcoin. They'd rather take out a loan against it to get some cash liquidity. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is a brilliant um, app. And I know Matt Dines is pushing that forward. And I, I, I'm totally supportive of that, supportive of what Unchained is doing. I mean, there's so many innovative products that are coming in the space. And I think, you know, it really behooves people to take the time to understand them. But, but it does take time and it takes a willingness to think outside of the box. But as my friend Foss says, I mean, the one thing you can be sure of is that, you know, your fiat is going to debase. And I know because I watched my father retire with with a, a fair amount of money for a Midwestern businessman in the 70s and 80s. And I watched how the purchasing power of that money just drained away over time. And, uh, and you know, I mean, you know, that sadly, I think that's going to happen to a lot of people. Um, you know, 10, losing, losing 10% of your purchasing power every year, you know, it, it makes you poor pretty fast. And, um, you know, that's if you're just if you're if you're hanging out in fiat, and you're hanging out in fiat bonds that are paying you 3% when inflation's 13, you know, you're losing 10% of your purchasing power every single year. You got to stop that. You got to, you got to fight back against that. Um, and so, you know, at a minimum, I, I try and counsel my clients to, you know, ask themselves what piece of my, what piece of your assets are in things that can't be printed or in sound money. Real estate qualifies too. And the negative there is obviously the taxes, but um, you know, the most obvious things that qualify are, are Bitcoin and gold and silver um, and to some degree equities, but you got to be careful there because I think the equity market is still in a bubble. So you got to pick and choose carefully. Yeah. And from experience, I think the, the most impactful thing is just have a tiny allocation, 0.1%, 1%, just play with it. Once you start looking at it, you have some skin in the right. game, you start to pay, pay attention closer and then everything else follows. But most that, people don't. That's, that that's, that's, that's exactly what I do. I say this, I say to people, look, you know, this has so much asymmetry, right? You can go up 10x, it can go up 100x. I think it's going up 1,000x. So if you put 1% of your net worth into this and you lose it, you still have 99% of your net worth. But if you put 1% in it and it goes up 100x, you've doubled your net worth. You know, so, I mean, how can you, how can you miss something like this? It's so friggin' obvious. You know, how can, I mean, you know, we all say it, we know it to be true. It's just the only wrong allocation is zero. You know, I mean, zero is just not the right answer. You have to own some Bitcoin. Don't want to own a lot? Fine. You know, and, what, and what's the worst that could happen? It could become worthless. It could become absolutely worthless. It could be a technical bug in the system. I think unlikely, 
but the whole thing could, could blow up and, and you lose what you've got in it, fine. But, you know, when you've got the chance to make three, five, 10, 50, 100, 200, 1,000 times your money over the next 20 or 30 years, you know, I, I think the future will be defined by those people who bought it and those who didn't. And there's going to be an enormous difference in the outcome. I mean, enormous. Um, you know, it's going to be like, you know, I think I, I told you about the Microsoft story. It's one of the great regrets of my life. I bought it with one of my early bonuses and I, I made some money and I went up two or three X and, um, and I, you know, and I, it's still a good company making money, growing, blah, 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 blah. I couldn't see what was going to happen. But I believed in PCs and I, I went to buy a condominium because I wanted to own a place to live in. So I sold my Microsoft stock, you know, right? and, you know and I got the 60 or 70 grand and we probably put in 20 and, uh, and I bought my condo and, and that was great. It's a nice condo. But the point is, if I had held on to that Microsoft stock, it would have been life changing. And, Hence uh, the, the point of this, the, the title of this plot, I don't know if we shared it, is The Last Trade. Yeah, yeah, that's a great title. That actually is a great title. Yeah, you don't need to trade it. You know, this is this is one of those. I mean, you know, grab a calculator and play with it. Do compound interest. I mean, if you if you can invest some normal sum of money, and you know, and that's the advantage young people have, right? Play with a calculator. Play with a compounding calculator. If you can invest some normal sum of money and compound it, even at ten or twelve percent a year, by the time you get ready to retire, it's stunning how big that number is. It's just stunning. I mean, compound interest, I mean, Buffett said it, compound interest really is one of the seventh wonders of the world. And I think what you've got here is you've got a, 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 a once in a lifetime opportunity to, to buy an asset that will compound forever or for a very, very long time. Um, and so uh, to me, I, you know, I recommend to all my clients that they own some Bitcoin. And, uh, um, you know, it, it, it takes time to understand why and to understand it. But I think everybody should take the time to do it because I think it, the future will be defined by those people who owned it and those who didn't. And I think that those who didn't are going to experience enormous regret, you know, if they were made aware of it and they didn't they didn't take a chance to buy some of it. The future will be written by the winners. Well, it will. Yeah, it will. Guess what, guys? We're going to win. Yeah. So it's... Uh... <laughs> We know, we know that. We're just trying to get more people on board because doing so will make it happen faster. And that's good for the, the world all around in every respect. I mean, there's so many. I mean, just apart from number go up, I mean, it, it, it's going to do so many good things in the world. I mean, just look at the remittances cases. Look at, I don't know, there's just there's so many, you know, look at the work Alex Gladstein is doing, you know, to, to bring it to third world countries. I mean, it's changing lives. It really is. So. I mean, you can back it on a number. You can back it because you're greedy. You can back it because you think it's the future. You can back it because you love the technology. You can back it because it helps poor people that are unbanked. I mean, there are a million different reasons. You can back it because it leads to energy efficiency by, you know, capturing stranded energy, as I know, Marty, you're doing with your mining company. There, there, you know, you can back it for 40 different reasons. You pick whichever one you like. But the fact of the matter is it's, a, it's an enormous technological paradigm shift. And if you miss it, you're going to regret it. I mean, it's like it's, this is like having the opportunity to buy into the Internet, you know, Google, Microsoft, whatever, something something very technolog technologically fundamental that is going to change the world. And so, you know, think of it in those terms. This nobody before this is an, to me, this is an enormous technological innovation that never existed until they solved about six different engineering problems at once, you know, cybersecurity, hash rate difficulty adjustment and on and on. And they solve them all in a way that gives you immutable digital scarcity. And that's a big fucking deal. It's a big, big, big deal technologically. Think printing press, think internet, think automobile, whatever. It's a fucking technical innovation. And so, you know, you either decide you're going to be betting on this technical innovation or you decide you're going to let it pass you by. And I, I know where my bet is. My bet is I'm, I'm betting on this technological innovation because I've seen this movie before. I saw it with the Internet. I saw it with PCs. It's the same movie. And we're in early days. So you're not too late. I mean, you think, well, I have friends who bought it for 100 or 300 or 1,000 or 5,000. Is it 30,000? I'm too late. No, you're not. This is buying Microsoft in 1987, you know, when it's up 10x, but it's about to go up 1,000x. That's how I see it. So... I, that's that's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> well, it's a great story and we really appreciate your time. This well, afternoon, Larry. It's always fun talking to you guys. You guys are the young tigers and I get re-energized when I 
when I see the youth of this country going in the right direction, you guys are at the forefront. Well, that's the other thing too. It's a, you have the direct positive externalities of Bitcoin, whether it be the energy, the scarce asset number go up. And then it's one thing culturally within Bitcoin. I know Michael and I have talked a lot about and others as well is that for me personally, it gave me confidence to have a large family to try to go grow a large family. And you see this with many other Bitcoiners now have this money that they're pretty confident isn't going to be debased and they're starting families younger going for more kids. Absolutely. When your time preference shifts and you see that that you're going to win and you see that you've got, you can actually save and they're not robbing from you every year. It's incredibly empowerful, empowering. I mean, I'm, I was depressed when I was, when I was in gold alone and getting my ass kicked on a regular basis by the powers that be, I was frigging depressed. And uh, you know, this thing, this thing has given me hope. It's, it, it's given me a lot of hope. And, and I think rightly so, not, not, just, not just kind of some emotional, stupid pie in the sky hope. I mean, I'm looking at it very hard, cold technologically, you know, what it is and saying, holy shit, you know, we got the tool here to make this thing work. So it's a good thing. It's a really good thing. It's an incredible thing. Larry, appreciate you joining. <laughs> uh, well, I look forward. To, hopefully we see you soon. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Anytime. Um, I'll be at all the shows. You know that. And I'm, as you know, I'm a loudmouth on Twitter. And I, I somebody's going to make me up a meme. I want somebody to make me up a meme. An old man yells at Federal Reserve or old man yells at central banks. Yes. I feel like I feel like that's my role. I mean, Jeff Booth always kind of chastised me. Jesus, dude, you got to be less angry. You got to be more positive. You got you know, you need to find Zen. And I'm like, dude, I can't find Zen. I want to kill these motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Totally spirit, spirit animal. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I'm telling you because they've just, they've made, you know, they've done so many bad things and they've made the world such a broken place. And they, you know, and, 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 and you got to call it out. I mean, it's not, I'd be like saying, I mean, I'm like, Jeff, okay. So Sam Adams was sitting there saying, oh, you know, the king's not such a bad guy. I mean, I know England really has our best interest at heart. We can live with this shit. Yeah, they want to tax us, but big deal. Oh, fuck that shit. The king's a fucking asshole. You know what I mean? We want our own goddamn country. We want to live by our own rules. The royalty is bullshit. You know, and, and so, you know, I think you gotta I think you gotta call them as you see them. And so that's why I do it the way I do it. It's yeah. different than I'm 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 more aligned with you. Spirit animal. I'm mad as hell. <laughs> and I'm I'm not gonna take it anymore. You yeah. Need some right? energy. Yeah, exactly. So Look, we all, you, you can't change your nature and, and I, you know, I am what I am. So I just, I'm not going to change. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I, I want to be Zen and very positive and I am positive on the outlook for the world, but I'm not at all happy. I'm these the central bankers who run this place have, have, you know, fucked us all up and killed a lot of people. And that makes me mad. It makes me very mad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hope the three of you enjoy the rest of your night. You too. I'm, I'm going to go home and, and, if Larry's going to uh, request that somebody who's listening to this make a meme about old man yelled central bank, we actually, Michael, Jesse, and I have a request too. We need an intro song for this podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we're going to open source the intro song to the audience. If any of you out there are equipped to, to hop in a garage band or uh, Adobe oh. premiere, whatever you, I, whatever I, you I, work I, with. I, I, two possibilities one is twisted sister we're not going to take it anymore <laughs> <laughs> and the second would be uh the second would be tom petty's uh i won't back down uh, i think i think a little metallica think don't tread on me and yeah, that one works too yeah <laughs> yeah um steve earl has one too um something about the revolution the revolution is now it's a re- great steve earl song um yeah no it's um it is what it is, right? We're in a fight and we're going to win it. So that's all good. It's really nice seeing you guys. I, I, I'm honored to be on your show, Marty, and I love you guys and all that you're doing. So keep up the fight. Well, Appreciate you, you joining us. Yeah, the yeah. honor's all ours, Larry. Keep killing it. And uh, <laughs> we'll see everybody. Stay mad. We need you. We need you mad out there. <laughs> stay mad, yeah. That's, well, I'll keep working out and I'll stay mad. All right. See you guys. See Thanks you. Care. We'll, uh, we'll be back next week, everybody. See you.